Okay, so this is Physical Behavior of Matter, Lesson 3. And our goal is today to review some key terms, recall how to manipulate equations, and how to solve heat equations. Now, we may not get through all of that. Um, this lesson is going to be about 20 minutes long at the most. All right, so let's get started. First of all, recall over the last couple of days that we've been talking about phase changes. Let's recall and review what we did. When we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, we're going uphill. Energy increases. When we're going from a gas to a liquid to a solid, energy decreases. So remember that uphill is associated with endothermic. So anytime I go uphill, it's going to be an endothermic reaction. And anytime I go downhill, going from a gas to a liquid to a solid, that it's going to be exothermic. Also recall here on the sides, some of you got to work with me yesterday if you were in the problem solving groups. Um, when we go from a solid directly to a gas, this right here, okay, that's called sublimation. And that is a word that you need to know for the Regents exam. Sublimation. There should be an I over here. And that's solid directly to gas. The opposite of that, going from a gas directly to a solid, is called deposition. And the Regents usually doesn't ask about this one. And I'm not sure why, but um, I always present it because I think you need to know both. So this is going directly from a gas to a solid. A good example of sublimation, as I mentioned yesterday, is um, dry ice, which is used when we have power outages. It's carbon dioxide in the solid form, and it sublimes directly into a gas, just kind of disappears. Another one that you're going to see in class as a demo is iodine. Iodine crystals, in the solid form when heated, sublime into a purple gas, and then when um, put on ice, will go straight back into the solid phase. Okay, let's review some questions about a heating and cooling curve. First of all, you should notice the uphill direction. So this is going to be um, an endothermic curve and it is heating a curve. So I would write that down right away when I look at a curve so that I know what I'm dealing with when I um, get presented with questions. Okay, at what temperature will the substance boil? Well, in order to know when it's going to boil, let's mark our phase changes in our phases. Let's just solid, this is liquid, this is gas, so this phase right here is going to be solid to liquid, and this one up here is going to be liquid to gas. So if they're asking me for boiling, that's going to be the upper plateau where it changes from a liquid to a gas, and I have to go over and read my graph carefully, and that is 90 degrees Celsius. At what temperature does the substance become a liquid? When is it going to be a liquid? All right, there's our line. So this looks like it's about 55 degrees Celsius. There we go. Between 55 and 90. So where is 55? So here's 55 and 90. So they're talking about this section of the graph right here. I'm going to highlight that in a different color. Let's see. So this section of the graph right here they're inquiring about and they want to know what's happening to kinetic energy. Well remember that kinetic energy only changes when temperature changes and because the temperature is increasing from 55 to 90 we know that kinetic energy is also increasing and I'm just going to put an up arrow. At 90 degrees, 90 degrees, that's up here at this plateau they want to know what's happening 
to potential energy. Remember, plateau begins with P, potential begins with P. That's the only time potential energy changes. So at the plateau, the potential energy is increasing because this is a heating curve. If it were a cooling curve, then instead of increasing at these different areas, kinetic energy and potential energy would be decreasing. Okay, so that's a review that we've done very quickly of the last couple of days. So, exothermic, remember the definition of exothermic means release. I know all of you know this. Gives off heat energy. So here you see energy going out away from the object. Examples of exothermic reactions are freezing and condensation. Those are exothermic. So non-examples would be the opposite of freezing. So melting would be a non-example. And the opposite of condensation is vaporization, or it's often, as you know, it called boiling. Let's review the term endothermic. Endothermic means that the system absorbs or gains energy. Endo meaning in, the energy is going into the system. Examples of endothermic reactions are melting and boiling. So non-examples would be the opposite of that, which would be freezing and condensation. All right. I want you to pause me right now, if you have to, to get out your reference tables. You need your reference tables in front of you at this point because I'm going to refer to table T and I'm going to refer to table B. Okay, heat, energy transfer due to a difference in temperatures. We de defined this in uh, lesson one. Okay, heat travels from an area of higher temperature to an area of lower temperature. The amount of heat lost or gained in a physical or chemical reaction can be calculated using the following equation. Q equals MC delta T. And if you notice in your reference table, they actually define all the variables for you. They tell you that Q equals heat. And it's measured, well, I don't think they tell you that it's measured in joules, but you do need to know that it's measured in joules. And M is in mass. C is the heat capacity of the substance. If you look on the front of your reference table, you'll see in table B that the heat capacity for water is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So what that means, okay, heat capacity returns to specific heat capacity. Every substance, gold, sand, glass, has a specific heat capacity. It's the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of that substance one degree Celsius. And change in temperature is pretty self-explanatory. This triangle is referred to as delta, so delta T is change in temperature, and it's basically um, the difference between T final and T initial. Now, one thing before we get started, sometimes you'll get a problem that will ask you for an answer in kilojoules. So we do need to have to remember how to convert between joules and kilojoules. It's very simply the same as converting from kilometers to meters. If you recall, in one of our previous units, we said that a kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. So one kilojoule is equal to a thousand meters joules. So very quickly, if I get an answer of 25 joules and I ask you to convert that to kilojoules, remember the unit that you want to cancel needs to go in the denominator. So a thousand joules equals one kilojoule. So now my joules cancel. 25 divided by a thousand is 0 0.02 five kilojoules. So please recall how to do that. You will have to make a conversion on some of these. Okay, 
Let's look at example one. I always like to uh, approach these problems as given, find, formula, solve. So we write down what we're given, how many joules, and what we have to find, and then our formula, substitute in with units, and then get an answer. So how many joules are absorbed? So we don't know our joules, that's our question mark, when 50 grams of water, so our mass is 50 grams, are heated from 30.2 to 58.6 degrees. All right. So we need two things. We need our specific heat capacity, which I told you was found in table B. So we know that that's 4.18. If we weren't dealing with water and we were given another substance, they would have to give us the specific heat capacity of that substance if they were asking us to solve for energy. And delta T. So we have delta T is equal to 58.6 minus 30.2, well, that was a little bit horrible with my writing, and that's going to be equal to 28.4 degrees. Okay, so we get our formula, Q equals MC delta T, and we substitute in. So we've got this equal to 50 grams times C, 4.18 joules per gram dot Celsius times 28.4 Celsius. Now I wrote all the units because I want you to see how this um, comes out to be joules. Remember we're finding Q, our answer needs to be joules. Grams cancels with grams, Celsius with Celsius. And I'm left with units of joules which is correct because I'm solving for Q. So I multiply 50 times 4.18 times 28.4 and I get an answer of 5,936.6 joules. That's my answer. Okay. What is the specific heat of silver if a 93.9 gram sample cools? Ah. So that's how we solve the problem. I want to show you or recall how we manipulate a formula. Okay? In the last problem we solved for Q, it was easy. We just multiplied mass times specific heat times delta T. But what if I ask you to find the mass? Now it's not so easy. Remember, reverse order of operations, PEMDAS. Okay? Parentheses, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So we have multiplication here. Opposite of multiplication is division. We're going to divide both sides by C delta T. And then this cancels. And I'm left with M equals Q divided by C delta T. What if I ask you to solve for C? Same thing. I'm trying to solve for C. This is multiplied, so everything's going to be divided by M delta T. These cancel. And I'm left with C is equal to Q divided by M delta T. So it's very easy to solve for any variable and equation if you just do the opposite of what you did, of what you have. Okay, next problem. So Q equals MC delta T. I'm going to write down what I have. I don't know what C is. It's saying what is the specific heat. Let me fix that. I have a 93.9 gram sample, so that's my mass, 93.9 grams. Cools from 215 degrees Celsius to 196. So delta T is going to be equal to 
215 minus 196, which is going to give me 19 degrees Celsius. And what else do I know? With a loss of energy. So I know that my Q is equal to 428 joules. That's a 4. Okay. Now this loss tells me something. I could ask you another, say, smaller short answer question. I could say, was this uh, an endothermic or an exothermic process? And because it lost, this would have been exothermic. Okay, just using this to give you some more information. That doesn't help us right now in solving the problem. So I have to solve for C. So on the previous page, we just said to isolate C, we divide both sides by M delta T. So M delta T. So C is equal to Q, which is 428 joules divided by the mass, which is 93.9 grams times delta T, which is 19 degrees Celsius. So notice how I have joules, grams, and Celsius. Well, that makes sense because the units for C are joules per gram dot Celsius. So 428 divided by 93.9 times 19 is going to give me an answer of 0 0.2398. So that's approximately 0 0.24, 0 0.24 joules per gram dot Celsius. Okay, let's do another one. If 100 joules are added to 20 grams of water at 30 degrees Celsius, what will be the final temperature? So we have Q equal to 1,000, or sorry, 100 joules. We have a mass uh, equal to 20 grams. And it's at 30 degrees Celsius. What will be the final temperature? So remember, delta T is really made up of two things. T initial and T final. Well, if I'm adding heat, I know that my temperature has to go up from what it is. So I have Ti equal to 30, but I don't really know what T final is. So the easiest way for me to do this is simply to just solve for delta T and then we'll break it down. So Looking at my formula, Q equals MC delta T. If I'm solving for delta T, this is multiply. I'm going to divide both sides by MC. So delta T is equal to Q divided by MC. So delta T is equal to my Q, which is 100 joules, divided by my mass, which is 20 grams, divided by Oh, I didn't write down my specific heat. I'm sorry. This is water, so it's the constant, 4.18 joules per gram dot Celsius. Now let's see what units cancel. So my joules are going to cancel. My grams are going to cancel. I'm going to be left with Celsius, and that makes sense because delta T is in Celsius. So delta T is equal to 100 divided by 20 times 4.18. And that's going to give me 11.96. So for purposes of this class, we can round this to 12 degrees Celsius. That is not my answer. All I did was solve for delta T. Remember, I need T final. Okay? So, there's two ways to do this. I can do it intuitively. First of all, I know that heat was added, so my temperature has to go up. So it's going to be 30 plus 12. So my final temperature is 42 degrees Celsius. That's equal to Tf. Okay, that's my answer. Or I can say delta T equals Tf minus T 
i. I know this is 12. We can make this an x. So 12 is equal to x minus 30. Well, opposite of subtraction is addition. So I'm going to add 30 to both sides. These cancel. And what do I get? x equal to 42. Same thing that I just got. So if you're very mathematically driven, you can use the formula. If you can see that heat was added, it was intuitive that you had to add them. If it said that heat was released, you would have subtracted. I am going to stop here. It's a rather short lesson, and that's okay. Tomorrow we're going to talk about heat of fusion and heat of vaporization problems. Stay tuned.